The International Space Development Conference is very honored to present Baz Landstorp from the Netherlands. Baz is, has a commercial venture that he's going to present to you about the first colonization mission to Mars. We're very honored to have Baz. And Baz, please come to the stage. I'd like to give Baz this award. <laughs> yeah. And it has Earth, Moon, and Mars. Let's give a warm welcome to Baz Landstorff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. And thanks for all the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great honor to be the opening uh, keynote speaker for the ISDC uh, conference. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for being here. And I would like to start with a question, actually. Why are we here? And I don't mean the that in a big sense, like the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, but <laughs> why are we today here in San Diego? And I'm pretty sure it's not for the money, because most of us can get different jobs in different industries where we would make more money. Also, I see a lot of students here, I think, and I don't think they study uh, uh, things that have to do with space because they think they will make the big bucks, because that's the wrong place. I think we are here because all humans have an inherent interest in going places. And that's why we are here. Humans explore. We have explored this planet in thousands of years, but it has already been thousands of years since we, dis we, since we populated the last continent. For thousands of years, we've not been going to new places. We've had a short trip to the moon, but we've not settled on new places. And we, you and I, most of us, we live in a time where during our lifetime we will go to the next place. And I believe that next place is Mars, because Mars is the most suitable place for permanent settlement of humans. And in our, in our time, in our lifetime, this will happen. We have the technology to do that. So I came... I became interested in, in space when I saw the, the little rover in the bottom of this picture, the first Mars rover. When I saw the pictures of that rover on TV, for some reason that I can really not explain to you, I thought, I want to go to Mars. I, I can't really explain it. I, I wanted to go there. I wanted to walk around there. I wanted to build. I'm a, I'm a builder. I wanted to build a place for humans to live, always having into, in mind that it would be a one-way mission. So, two years ago I started uh, Mars One. Uh, I studied mechanical engineering at Twente University and I worked on a PhD for a couple of years until I found a really good, uh, good opportunity to start my own business. So to the great disappointment of my mom, I abandoned my PhD and started my first company in wind energy. Uh, I sold uh, part of that company uh, uh, two years ago when I found the missing piece of the puzzle for a human mission to Mars. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. So, two years ago, I started Mars One together with my co-founder, Arno Wilders. And there are a couple of things that are unique about Mars One, that are different about Mars One than other ideas for Mars missions. So, the most important one is that we've tried to build a mission with existing puzzle pieces, existing technologies. So, instead of first designing a mission and then looking, okay, which, which people can buy the components that we need. We started the other way around. We looked at what is available, what puzzle pieces of technology are available, and can we puzzle together a, piece, uh, a, a complete mission design that takes humans there and supports them, supports them there without using puzzle pieces that don't exist. So we've, we've used rocket technology that is existing or very close to existing. Uh, we, we use technology that's pretty close to the, the extensive technology that's uh, present, especially here in the US, on landing uh, things on Mars. We're using technology that has been tried and tested in the International Space Station for life support, and we use technologies for robotics that, uh, that are existing technology for, for preparing a human settlement before humans go. And so we've, we've looked around for these technologies, but after that, the first thing we did was visit the companies of whom we were using those puzzle pieces and talking to, their, to, talking to their business developers and their engineers and explaining their plan to them. 
uh, our, our requirements, our budgets and our timelines, and they've, they've given us feedback, so uh, should be more expensive or you need more time for this. Um, and with their feedback, we have designed a plan of which we believe that it is possible in the timeline and in the budget that I will present to you. So existing puzzle pieces, a very important uh, thing about Mars One. And our first uh, aerospace supplier, Paragon Space Development from Tucson, Arizona, is already under contract of Mars One and beginning work on the life support systems and uh, the Mars suits. So very important about Mars One, I've already mentioned it, this puzzle piece that you see on the, on the screen now is the return mission. And the, this puzzle piece simply does not exist. First of all, there's no rocket technology that's big enough to launch a return vehicle from Earth to Mars, but also it's just not tested. And the time when, when Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, they never actually tested the, uh, the ascent vehicle and the landing vehicle on the moon before it was tried and tested. That would not be acceptable in this time. So before we can, before we can organize a return mission, we have to put a rocket there and fly it back unmanned because otherwise it's just not going to be acceptable in the current day and age where risk is really a, a big issue. So no return trip, that's a very important par part of our mission. Another thing that's unique is uh, we try to do this as internationally as possible. A lot of the technologies that we need are, are only available in the US. So for instance, landing on Mars, the technology is only available in the US. But there are companies around the world that can do this. And there are space experts around the world ca that can help us uh, design our mission, improve our plan. So this is, these are a couple of names from our advisory board and our uh, board of ambassadors. Uh, top left, you see a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Gerard Het Hoofd. Uh, next to him is the Malaysian astronaut, the, the first Malaysian astronaut. Uh, next to him is uh, Mary Roach, an American writer. I'm not going to name everybody because we're running a little bit late on schedule, but bottom uh, right is Gunther Reitz from the German Aerospace Institute. We try to get advisors and ambassadors from all over the world to support us for, for their knowledge, but also to make this a mission of the entire world. We want the world to go to Mars. And most important there is our desire to send in the first crew, four humans from four different continents, two men and two women, to really have a good representation of the, of the world. So what does this plan look like? Well, I think our, our tightest deadline is our 2016 mission. In 2016, we want to send an, a demonstration mission to Mars, where we prove the technology uh, that we want to use for all the other missions that come after that. In 2018, uh, we're going to send a rover to Mars that's going to drive around on the surface and it's going to find the best location for the settlement. And the rover will land in the same technology as the demonstration mission to, to build that uh, track record. In, 2020, in 2020, we're going to send all the hardware to Mars that we need for the human settlement. So it's going to be a second supply mission, a second rover, uh, two life support units and two living units. They will land all over the place, of course, and the rovers will pick them up and drive them to the location of the settlement. They will deploy the solar panels of the, uh, of the life support systems, one of the solar panels. They will in, uh, extract the inflatable parts of the settlement and they will uh, activate the life support systems, feeding it with uh, wet soil, soil that contains uh, water crystals, and uh, evaporate the water from the soil, condensing it to, uh, to its liquid state for, to, to have a water storage before the humans leave. The water will be used to create uh, oxygen and will we'll filter nitrogen and argon from the atmosphere as the inert component of the atmosphere. And in this way we will prepare the human settlement, we will make it habitable even before the humans leave. And only when everything is working, when everything is confirmed to be working, when there's water and breathable air in the settlement, only then will the first crew of four people leave in 2022 and land on Mars in 2023. So they will find that habitable settlement, but there's a lot of work to be done. They will need to do a lot of construction, they will deploy the rest of the solar panels, they will install the hallways between the modules, uh, they will activate the greenhouse equipment to grow their own food on Mars. Of course, they will have emergency rations, but we hope that they can rely on their own food production and even produce the food for the crew 
that's coming after uh, crew number one. So prepare the emergency rations for crew number two. A few weeks after crew number one lands, the hardware for crew number two will already land because the hardware is always going two years ahead of the crews. So the crew number one will not just have the redundant systems that they find on Mars when they land, but they will have also another complete set of redundancy uh, for crew number two that's coming two years after. And they'll also have the living volumes in which they can produce uh, the food, the, the emergency rations for crew number two before they leave from Earth. And in this way, we're, we're going to try to send more crews to Mars every two years, another crew of four every two years. Now, we believe that all the technology to do this is out there. There's a lot of engineering to be done, a lot of testing, and it will take a lot of money, it will take a lot of time. There are certainly risks for, for delays, uh, for budget overruns, and we've taken those into account, and we believe that we have a mission that can be done. No new inventions are needed to land humans on Mars and keep them alive there. But how much does it cost? It will cost about six billion US dollars to land the first four people on Mars and another four billion for every crew that we send after that. Now that sounds like a lot of money, and actually it is a lot of money, <laughs> but imagine what will happen when the first humans land on Mars. It happened in the moon landing, actually almost by, by accident. I don't think the, the, the US government had imagined the enormous impact of the images, which we, we still see them on TV. I think once a week we, see, we still see uh, the images of the, of the moon landing, of the rover driving over the moon. These are images that are going to be here forever. And in a thousand years, people will sto still know these images. Imagine doing the same, but having this already in mind. And doing this, not in 1969, but in 2023, when there are four billion people on this planet who have access to the internet. Four billion people will be watching the same screen at the same time. And there's a lot, a lot of value in that. It will be the biggest audience ever, even bigger than the audience of the Olympic Games. And what I didn't know, and that was the last missing piece of the puzzle, when I started, I started Mars One, when I found out the revenue numbers for the Olympic Games. In just three weeks of broadcasting, because the Olympic Games only last for three weeks, in three weeks of broadcasting, they have revenues, the International Olympic Committee has revenues of around four billion US dollars. More than one billion US dollars per week, just because the world is watching. Well, if you know this, then suddenly six billion dollars doesn't sound like so much money anymore. It's just six week, weeks of an Olympic audience, while the audience for a mission to Mars will be a lot larger, especially in the weeks around launch and the weeks around landing. So Mars One is now working on this for more than two years. We started with just two people. We are now a team of 10 people. We have uh, uh, sponsors from all over the world, from Australia, UK, US, uh, Netherlands, of course. We have advisors and ambassadors from all over the world that support what we do. We have the University of Twente, a, a Dutch university that became our first science and education partner, and we are actively looking for more universities to join us as our science and education partners, because we feel that a mission to Mars is the greatest opportunity to educate people. This will get people back in, interested in engineering. We have our first supplier under contract, Paragon Space Development. I've already told you that. So we are taking the steps. And just about four weeks ago, four weeks and two days ago actually, we launched our astronaut application process. We invite people from all over the world to apply to become one of our astronauts. And the response on that has been truly tremendous. In the first one and a half weeks, we have received more than 78,000 applications. 78,000 people have, have subscribed to, to become one of our astronauts from all over the world, from more than 120 different countries. And this was in the first one and a half weeks. And we're, we're waiting to announce the, the current figures until we have a nice round uh, figure. But people are so interested in this. Space interests people as long as you do exciting things. 
We have the technology to do this. The money is really not the issue. We can do this. Let's go to Mars. Thank you very much. Sorry? Thank you. Well, folks, um, I, do we have a couple minutes, perhaps? Yeah. I'm sure there are people here who may have a couple of questions. So if you do have them, feel free. Bass? Is there a microphone we could pass? Can you hear them? Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I can hear you if you talk loud, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, they're in the back. So the question is, uh, after Apollo uh, 11, uh, there was a, a quick decline in the interest of the audience. How, how are we going to solve that for the third and the fourth mission? And of course, sustaining the people who are now living on Mars the rest of their lives. Um, so we've talked about that with media people from all over the world, with experts. And first, the first answer is, uh, we will make this a mission about, about humanity going to Mars. So these are not just... Uh, just people that were selected by the space agency, we will involve the audience in picking the people after, of course, we've made sure that only the qualified people are there. And uh, so these will not just be people, these will be our TV friends, which we follow in the training. Our TV friends will be going to Mars. And that will uh, assure, according to all the media experts we talked to, a much longer interest than, the, uh, than, in the, uh, than was there in the Apollo missions. But the maybe more important is that Mars One will... Uh, Mars One is another aerospace company. We're having aerospace company develop all the products that we need, all the systems that we need. But while there are no new inventions required, there will be new, new systems, new technologies, new, IP, new IPs developed. And uh, in the contracts with these suppliers, we will make agreements on the, uh, on the, on the IP. So Mars One will be co-owner of the IP. And uh, this will become, especially in the later years, a major source for, for revenue. But actually, the uh, the, the media people that we talk to, they say people will watch this for 50 years. So even, even from that point of view, there's not so much uh, doubt in the, uh, in the minds of the experts. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Hold on. Okay. Have you considered using a robotic sample return mission from Mars to test your uh, Mars ascent vehicle? Well, our people are staying on, Mar uh, on Mars, so we don't need the ascent vehicle. Our people are staying there, and that, that is the reason why we can do this with existing technology. You don't need the ascent vehicle, and we don't need the larger uh, landing equipment, the l l larger Mars descent vehicles that are required in those return missions. So these people are staying there the rest of their lives. I have a question. Baz, we have one more question. Oh. I, have, I have one question. So, Bass, I've read up on your project. It's fascinating. I've also read that there are concerns, and it's always important to address concerns before things take place. One of the concerns is, of course, the extreme level of deprivation, the environment, but also psychologically, even spiritually, for people to endure the inhospitable climate, all the challenges. There have been people who have been on Antarctica, and they've said, you know, that would be a picnic compared to living on Mars for two years. Now, I know that you're planning to do this like a reality show, so it's really a compound question. Are you going to be covering people while they're on Mars? And if so, how do you prepare psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, people to really prepare for that challenge? So, um, the, the, most, uh, uh, the first part of that is selection. So we will select people of whom we believe that they are the right people to do these kinds of things. And after that uh, is training. So we will, uh, our selection process for this first, uh, for this first uh, couple of groups that we will train is uh, in the next two years. So 2015, we will select about uh, six groups of four people to train full-time for the mission. So they will become full-time employees of Mars One, training for the mission. We will build copies of the Mars outpost, uh, first in uh, not so remote locations, because for logistic reasons it's easier, but further down the project more and more in uh, in the Mars analog locations, uh, finally, hopefully, in, the, uh, in one of the Arctic deserts. And there we will, in all of those missions, we will really give the people who are in there, the people who are training, 
as much as possible the same situation as they find on Mars. So limited water usage, uh, delays in communication with your family, no, no, all those inputs that are not there. Uh, so we will train them as well as possible for that. But one very important thing that, you, that we shouldn't forget is that these people are not really gone. They're only 40 minutes away from their fans, friends and family, so they're actually closer to home than people who migrated around the world in the, in the early 1900s, because they could only send letters. They, these people can send video mails to their, to their friends and families, they can receive video mails, they will be an intricate part of, of Earth, because these are heroes uh, that, are, that are taking this next step. So, uh, your question about the, the, the TV aspect, this is, this, is their, this is their lives, it's not their, their job. So on, from Mars, of course, they will make the, the most exciting TV ever. They will tell the most exciting stories because they are doing the most exciting thing that there is. But it's their life. We can't expect them to share all of their life with us. So there will be limitations on, on, what, uh, on what will be shared. And this will be a, a discussion. So th these people will be proud of what they do, so they will want to t tell about it. But there are certain things that they won't want to share. So maybe their dinner is something that they really want to keep private. So the, at the dinner, there's no cameras. But it's up to them. And don't forget, they are in charge. Because if we tell them, oh, you have to turn on camera number two, and they say, uh, well, sorry, we're not going to do that, <laughs> then what can we do? We don't follow them into the shower, is what you're saying. OK. Uh, Baz, we have one, more one more question. Yeah, by your timeline, you're uh, about three years away from your first launch. And there won't be any people on that launch. so you don't quite have that same human element to gin up interest. So uh, where's the money coming from for the first unmanned launch with such a close timeline? Well, this is really, this is our biggest challenge. So the, the peak interest will be when humans leave and when humans land. So we have, we have already substantial interest also from the media. Uh, there's, we're talking to, I just came from LA where we're talking to people about uh, the, the selection format because we will first have our experts determine which which of the candidates that we have on our website are good, but once there are only qualified people left, we want to involve the audience in deciding who are our envoys of mankind to the next planet. Because this is the most important election ever, and we believe that people should have a say in that. So that, there will already be a lot of excitement, but you're absolutely right, we won't make the six billion before we need it. Uh, so there we need to uh, uh, convince uh, investors, uh, partners, sponsors, media companies, that this is actually going to happen. Because they say, if you, can, if you can demonstrate to us that this will really happen, then the money is not an issue. So our, our, our plan is to take uh, small steps, so having the, the first conceptual design studies done by our suppliers now, showing those results, so showing the additional, uh, uh, the additional technical uh, readiness to our, to our investors, uh, asking them and, and our partners for more funds to go to the, design, the detailed design and th that way, step by step, working towards financing, finally uh, pre-financing the $6 billion uh, that we need to send to first humans. But that's what you just pointed out is definitely our biggest challenge. Okay. Time's up, I think. Baz, I have a question for you. In what sequence will you be going to Mars? <laughs> yeah, I started off my presentation by telling you that I started working on this because I wanted to go to Mars. Um, there's a few, a few reasons why I will not be going. Uh, first of all, I have a really nice girlfriend and she's not coming with me and I don't want to go without her. But actually more importantly, I think, I, I just told you that we will be sending mankind's envoys to the next planet. So the audience, you will determine who is going to Mars because as I said, it's the most important election ever. And I think it would be truly wrong if I would jump queue and take one of the seats, so yeah, I'll stay right here. Okay, we have one final question from a very distinguished gentleman. I think we all know who he is. Uh, the, the things I'll say may be more, maybe suggestions for you to investigate in the future, uh, but I think uh, a cooperation with like events, like proposals, uh, would uh, share some of their support and some of their concerns that they have because they're planning similar ventures. Specifically, I'm talking about Inspiration Mars, which needs long-term life support for, uh, to carry out their 500-day uh, journey. Uh, the other is uh, Golden Spike, 
which is trying to get, I believe, their most successful uh, applicants will come from nations who do not have space programs who would like to pool their money uh, a large amount and contribute it to deep, to, to Golden Spike for their person to be able to go uh, and land on the moon and, and come back. Uh, I think that you could uh, consider partnering uh, with them. Um, I, uh, I wish you well. I do hope that it doesn't interfere with any of the uh, aerospace companies that, uh, that need to develop things for a national program that is leading international. Uh, I can see where uh, the, the reverse could be true, that you could motivate them with some resources to prepare the things that will be needed for a national, international program. That's where I think uh, commercial activities such as yours or individual efforts could best contribute uh, to maybe longer term. Uh, what do you do if you find that you're unable to carry through the first landing, and yet you have enlisted people to spend a considerable amount of time uh, in training for this mission. Uh, if it's unsuccessful that you're able to embark on this, do they get compensated for spending all the time uh, that you've caused them to divert from uh, their, their other uh, occupations? Yeah. So, uh we're not in, in discussions with Golden Spike yet, but I've talked to Dennis Tito uh, at the uh, Washington Humans to Mars uh, Summit, and it's definitely, uh, they, they are uh, four years before our humans are departing, they are proving a lot of the technology, so we're certainly uh, going to look into uh, cooperation on that, and uh, Golden Spike is, uh, is also a very relevant uh, a partner for us to talk to. Uh, and uh, so, so your second point was, uh, what about the applicants, what if it doesn't happen? Um, and this is a very ambitious plan that we are presenting and uh, as I said there are of course risks for delays and there are even risks, I truly believe that we can, that we can do this, but there are risks that uh, it, it, will be, it will not happen. But um, the people that we, that we uh, train, they will be full-time employees of Mars One, so they will, they will already get a normal uh, paycheck. And I, there, were already, there were also people of course who were training to go to the moon and never went. So this is just... Uh, an, uh, a, par a part of the life of every person who's training to go to space. You never know that you are going until you are in the rocket. And uh, that's, just, uh, that's just part of it, um, part of the deal. And, um, but I know that the people who, who are volunteering for this, who are subscribing to what we are doing, that they, they are very aware that uh, there are, will be a lot of people applying and that only four will go in, uh, in hopefully 2023. But thank you very much. Thanks, and I thank you, everybody. I just want to mention, too, that Buzz Aldrin will be here to sign, autograph his brand new book, Mission to Mars. So I hope all of you will check that out. Make sure when you line up, you get an extra copy for a member of your family. Buzz will also be the keynote speaker to lunch on Saturday. And uh, last I checked, Dave, it was like $60. So that is a value. That's a deal, isn't it, folks? All right, so we hope you'll all come out for that. And um, I want to thank you all for showing up today. There's plenty more exciting speeches to come. We're running a little bit late. We're going to have the asteroid track starting here with Steve Covey shortly. Um, also, we have some program changes. Uh, the Mars Desert Research Station talk by Jerry Williams is going to be replaced by David Brummer of 5D Robotics talking about how to use robots in autonomous modes. So uh, thank you all for enjoying this session and uh, we'll get things kicked off with the asteroid track in about five minutes. Thank you. Thanks everybody.